Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about plant nutrition and transport. I'm going to use a number of terms that you should be familiar with, like monocot dicot or ground tissue vascular tissue. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, make sure you go back and watch the previous podcast on plant structure. Um, but before we get into that, we should talk about what plants need. In other words, what is the nutrition that plants count on? Well, it's the same thing as in you. They need schnapps. And so basically what they need is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And so where do they get the carbon? Well, unlike us, they're going to take carbon in in the form of carbon dioxide. So that's going to come in through their leaves. Um, they're going to absorb their water, so they're going to get their hydrogen and oxygen through um, their roots as well. But the other things like nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, they're all going to take in through their roots. Now how does that differ from animals? Well, we simply eat things uh, like plants, or we eat things that eat plants, and so we can get all of those nutrients. And so basically we're kind of talking about the digestive, circulatory, and respiratory system all in one in relation to plants. And so basically plants live in two worlds. They live in the world above ground, and that's the world of the shoots, and then they live in a world below ground, and that's in the world of the roots. And so basically the one thing that they're taking in through their leaves is carbon dioxide. And they're using that carbon dioxide to make sugars. And those sugars are going to make up the bulk of a plant, uh, but they're also going to be used for energy within the plant. Now. As far as roots go, they need water, and so that water is going to flow in through their roots, it's going to move up through the xylem, and it's eventually going to evaporate through their leaves. And so they're taking that water in, and the one thing that may puzzle you a little bit on this diagram is that they're also taking in oxygen. They're taking in oxygen through their roots. And you might think, that seems a little odd. What do they need oxygen for? Well, remember, they do photosynthesis, and they're using photosynthesis to take in the energy of the sun and convert that carbon dioxide into sugars, but they're going to use those sugars as well. So they do cellular respiration. What do you require for cellular respiration? You need sugars, and they're going to produce those through um, photosynthesis, but they also need oxygen. And so any part of a plant that's growing or requires energy is also going to require oxygen. Okay, let's start at the roots and then kind of work our way up through the shoots. I'm going to have examples here. These are the dicots and the monocots. So remember, a quintessential example of a dicot would be like a sunflower. And a monocot is going to be corn, or a dicot could be a dandelion, and monocot could be grass. But basically what we're going to do is we're going to work our way up from the roots to the stems and then finally to the leaves. And you'll find that there are similarities between the two, but subtle differences. And so if we start in the roots, what we're looking at here is a cross section. So imagine Imagine that a root looks kind of like this, and there's going to be root hairs coming out of it. Basically what we'll do is we'll just take a cross section, so we're cutting right across like that, and that's why we have this kind of a circle. And so basically what do we have here? Well, there are three types of tissues. Remember, there's going to be an epidermis on the outside, so you can see the epidermis here. There's going to be ground tissue here in the middle, and so on the monocot, same thing, epidermis on the outside, and then it's going to be ground tissue right here. But you're going to have vascular tissue on the inside, so that vascular tissue is going to be made up of xylem and phloem, and it's kind of hard to see with that. That color. Likewise here we're going to have xylem and we're going to have phloem. The phloem is going to be right outside of that. And so basically if you think about it, in the roots the vascular tissue, that's going to be the movement of water and the movement of nutrients, is going to be centered in the middle of the root. Now if you think about it, that doesn't make sense. How is the water going to get from the outside to the center? Well every time we build new roots, you can see this is roots actually in a, in a uh, in a potato, you'll see that they're actually starting at the bottom and then they're growing up from the center. And so it's kind of like a plumbing network where it's going to start on the outside, it's going to move to the inside, and then three-dimensionally it's going to go up in the plant. Now if you look at the edge, some of these cells are modified into what are called root hairs. And the function of that is to increase surface area. And a lot of these have fungus that are living in and around them, symbiotic fungi, that allow them to absorb even more nutrients. Now we're going to go above ground into the shoot system and we're going to look at the stems. And so what you'll find is that we're still going to have the epidermis on the outside. You can see that. So here's the epidermis on the outside. It's going to have that cuticle on the outside of that. But what we start to see in the dicot is that the 
those, the vascular tissue is moving from the center of the root towards the edge of the stem. And the reason why is it eventually has to flow out into the leaves. And so right here would be the xylem closer to the edge. We're going to have the phloem here. So this would be the xylem here, the phloem here, and a dicot. Likewise here, we're going to have the phloem here, uh, excuse me, the xylem and then the phloem right here. I've always thought these look kind of like little monkey heads in a monocot. And then we're going to have the epidermis out here. What are all the other cells then? The other cells are going to be ground tissue. So that's going to be ground tissue here as well. All right, let's keep going because remember those stems are eventually going to bud off and those are going to reach to the leaves. And so if we look at leaves, remember what makes a dicot a dicot is it's going to have this net-like venation. So you can see these nets that are branching off. Those nets, those veins are actually the vascular tissue. And so if we look at a cross section right here of a dicot, you can see that vascular tissue moving right through the middle. Likewise, if we go to a monocot, what makes them a monocot? Well, one of the characteristics is you're going to have all these parent parallel veins that are going through the leaf. And so you can see that those veins are vascular tissue that's moving right through the leaf, if I try to kind of draw this three-dimensionally. But both of them are going to have essentially the same uh, characteristics when you get to the level of the leaf. So now we're taking a cross section of the leaf. We've got our epidermis on the top. You've got the waxy cuticle above that. We're going to have epidermis on the bottom. You can see right here that there's a stomata there. What's the stomata for? That's to take in carbon dioxide and also to lose water. Um, some of the other levels that we have in here is this. We're going to call this the palisade mesophyll. And then we're going to have this down here, which is going to be the spongy mesophyll. And so basically, what is that? And it's organized different in dicots and, and monocots. But basically, this palisade mesophyll, it's like palisades, like a waterfall, um, is going to be an area where we have photosynthesis going on. So we're going to have light coming in. And that light is hitting chloroplasts. And that's where the photosynthesis is taking place. But what else do we need for photosynthesis? Well, we need that water. That's going to come through the vascular tissue. And then we need carbon dioxide. So the bottom part here, all of that space down here is for the carbon dioxide gas to diffuse in and then can be used in uh, photosynthesis. One quick thing I should mention going way back down to the leaves again, our immune system kind of protects us from its environment. And also our, our, uh, our skin is going to protect us and it's going to allow things in that we want and things out that we don't. And so basically the way it works in uh, the roots of a plant is a little bit different. And so imagine now we're down right in here. We're down in the root hairs like this. So how is water getting in? Water's flowing in through osmosis. So it's flowing in here to the middle. And remember, it's going to go to the center of the root and then it's going to work its way up. But we don't want to let just anything come in. And the way water flows is kind of odd. Some of the water is going to flow. So this is one cell, and this is another cell. So some of the water is going to flow within the cell. So it'll go across a membrane, and it'll flow through these little pores between the cells called plasmodesmata. But some of it will actually move through the cell wall. So you can see this water right here would be moving through the cell wall. And it's never having to go across a cell membrane. And so basically what plants have is that, now let me do a quick cross section. So if this is the epidermis and this is the vascular tissue on the inside of a root, so the water is going to flow in like this. Basically, we don't want it to flow up in a plant unless we have had some say over what's coming in. And remember, what protects our cells, what allows certain things in and certain things out, that's going to be the cell membrane. And if you look at this water, since it's going all the way across here, we call that apoplastically, it's moving through the cell wall, it's never had to go across a cell membrane. And so basically what happens is you're going to have an endodermis here. This has a lining around it. And there's going to be a waxy cuticle called the Casparian strip. And you can kind of see it right here. This is that Casparian strip that's connecting all the cells. And basically what it does is it acts almost as, uh, I don't know if you've seen The Lord of the Rings, but there's a scene where Gandalf you know, puts his staff down and says, you shall not pass. Basically, what the Casparian strip is doing is it's this, it's this strip that goes all the way across here. And it's basically forcing that water that's made it all the way to the inside of the vascular tissue. It can't keep sneaking through the cell wall. It'll have to force its way into the cell. 
and it has to go symplastically at that point. So the function of the Casparian strip is to force the water eventually to go across a membrane so we have control. And so we just have two things left to talk about and that's basically how water moves up a plant and then how sugar moves in a plant. And we've talked about transpiration before but I want you to think about it as a pull. In other words there's going to be xylem which are these vascular tissues that go all the way from the roots all the way up in a tree. It's going to go all the way up uh, the inside of the bark all the way up to the leaves and eventually evaporate. And so there's a connection all the way up from the roots to the leaves. But there's also something important you should know about water. Water is slightly charged and that means that this uh, right here the, the oxygen is going to have a slightly negative charge and the hydrogen is going to have a slightly positive charge. And so basically water will line up so the negative oxygen is attached to the positive hydrogen. And we call this bond right here a hydrogen bond. And so basically water is all connected through these hydrogen bonds. And so once one bit of water starts flowing up the tree, the other ones are going to follow. And we call that process, or we call that phenomenon, cohesion. There will also be some adhesion to the inside of the xylem. So two quick things you should know about xylem. It's dead at maturity. And so these are cells that are now empty. They're not alive anymore. It's simply just a container or vessel for the water to flow through. But basically if we go all the way up here to the leaf, water is evaporating out. So the H2 is evaporating out. That water is connected all the way back through the vascular tissue, through the leaves, through the veins, all the way back down through down here to the root hairs. And so we have a continuous pathway all the way up of water. And so every time one water molecule evaporates here in the leaf, that's going to pull this whole chain up. And so really xylem and the water is moved through a pulling process. What's generating all of that energy to pull it up? It's going to be the sun is pulling it all the way up like that. Okay, now last thing then is how does phloem move? Well, phloem is different. Phloem are cells. So here's one cell, here's another cell, here's another cell. Um, they're empty. And so how do you be alive as a cell and be empty? Well, basically they'll have these companion cells that are going to have a nuclei and they're connected to the phloem cells. And they're going to provide the metabolic support for phloem. But phloem is a living cell and xylem we said is dead. They're going to be little connecting holes all the way through here and same thing over here. There will be connectors like that. And so basically I like to think of it as being pushed. And so phloem and sap and sugar is actually pushed around in a tree. And you might be thinking how does that work? Well let's look at this carrot here. So we've got a carrot. It's planted underground and let's say that it's the second year and this carrot happens to be coming back again. Well if you think about it where is the sugar going to be if this plant is just starting to grow well more of the sugar is going to be in the carrot and so if more of the sugar is going to be in the carrot so we have sugar here that sugar is going to flow out from an area of high sugar concentration down in the carrot into low sugar concentration in here. Um, we're also going to get flow of water in this direction but basically the sugar is going to be pushed in this direction. Since there's more sugar down here we call that the sugar source. And so phloem is actually going to be pushed from the source to the sink. Okay so there's more sugar down here. Where is it going to go? Well there's sugar all the way down here so that sugar is going to start to flow up to here. The leaves it's early in the spring we'll say and so they're starting to grow so they're not making any sugar yet. That means there's no sugar here. And so we call this a place where there's no sugar the sink. It's just like a sink. So the water flows from the source to the sink. Sugar does the same thing. So the sugar is going to flow up here and then it's going to move into these cells. And so basically we get this flow of sugar like this. This is going to be early in the spring. But let's say the carrot starts to grow and now we've got photosynthesis going on and now we've got these leaves producing a bunch of sugar. Well now this is the sugar source. So we're making a bunch of sugar here. That's going to push the sugar down here from an area of high sugar to low. That's going to be stored down here in the carrot and so that's going to become the sink when it's active. And so basically what we get is this flow of sugar always from the source to the sink but we have this flow of water all the way up the tree continuously as long as the sun is shining. So that's basically how materials moved around in a plant. Uh, tells you a little bit about what they need, how they get it and I hope that's helpful.